Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this <coughs> session, Sex on Screen. How far can we go? I just wanted to first ask everybody if you can turn off your mobile phones. Um, Except for me. And I just want to introduce our, our panel today. So we have Sarah Ramsden from Channel 4, our chairperson, Greg Sanderson from BBC. We have Barbara Truin from VPRO in the Netherlands. Truin. And Sonny, uh, Sonny Bergman, who's a filmmaker, had a film screening this morning called Slutphobia, also from the Netherlands. So thank you very much. And I'm just going to hand it over to Greg, our chairperson. Thank you for coming. Thank you for surviving this long into Sheffield and coming for what is going to be an intellectually stimulating session, I think. Uh, stimulating in many ways, I suspect. Um, I thought we'd gently start this, since it's a, it's a no-holds-barred panel discussion, uh, by asking all of my panellists what's their most outrageous sexual encounter. Sonny, would you like to go first? No, let me think about that. But it's a really weird question. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, there's underlying assumptions that there could be such thing as outrage, because then you think, oh, God, I did a gangbang with ten guys or something like that, but um, I think it's more interesting to talk about vulnerability in sex. Well, we're coming on to the serious. This, okay. this is a light-hearted <laughs> opening. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't answered. I'm thinking. Sarah? I, I'm, I can't say the, the most outrageous thing I've done. It's absolutely impossible to say it in this public forum, but way less outrageous. I did... Did a Totoga party at college have um, sex in Christchurch cloisters? I think it deserves a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara? I'm going to embarrass you now. My biggest fantasy, Greg, is <laughs> to have a gangbang with my gay husband. And my gay husband, everybody knows about my gay husband, so I've got a real husband. But who's I not gay. also, who's not gay, I think, I don't know, but I don't think he is. But I also have three gay husbands, <clears throat> and I met them on, so I've got this little group of husbands. I met them on the circuit. One of them is Greg Sanderson. So I think my biggest fantasy would be to have a gangbang with my gay husband without having any sex whatsoever. <laughs> that sounds ideal. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Right, let's get on to the, the serious stuff. So, Sonny, you, your film's been screened this morning. Mm -hmm. Just what, do you want to briefly outline it for people and explain? The, the, the film? Um, well, it's, it's investigating the double standard, why, why there is uh, such a thing, and the idea of the slut. What is a slut, or why is there such a, uh, a name or a concept of a slut? And um, I'm going into the history of it. I'm looking at pornography. Um, because in pornography, you find that uh, the slut concept is very marketable. And um, I'm, I'm actually very interested on the effect of it on women, because I started from the personal perspective that I felt I was a sexually liberated woman, had sex with different partners and everything, but there was still something holding me back, maybe not being honest in the bedroom or having sex when I wasn't really enjoying it that much. And I was thinking, it's a weird paradox that I was grown up by this fe feminist mother and she said, you can do whatever you want, but I still didn't feel very or completely liberated. And I, I, I saw that a lot around me with my friends when we were talking about sex. And I didn't see that discussion in the public arena. So I want to make that film. And it was, um, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a definitely a feminist film in the sense of I, I want to, um, um, well, redefine female sexuality in a more positive way. Yeah. Should we have a look at, a look at the first clip? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, fascinating how candid people were willing to be in that clip. Yeah, yeah, I, I was surprised as well. We, we went with this tent uh, around the world and... Uh, we just asked people on the street if they want to be interviewed. And the ones that were the most uh, spontaneous, they were often the best interviews. So did you find your preconceptions completely challenged in making it? Um, no, actually. Well, I was looking for what I was looking for. <laughs> so in that <laughs> sense, I wasn't. Um, I, was, I was very happy that people were so honest. There was a lot of women that were confirming the kind of experiences I had. 
Like they were, there were even couples whereby the, they would lie together and the, the woman would say, I've often had sex with him when I didn't enjoy it. And the man would just be lying there stone faced. And that was, that was really. We've all been there. <laughs> that was really daring of these women to say that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But you, did you come out of it thinking differently from how you went in then? Or you, you said you know what you wanted to make? Well, I mean, there's, a, there's like stuff that I didn't know. For example, when I looked into the history of female sexuality, the idea of a nymphomaniac, which is a word that can only describe a woman, comes from um, a time whereby female lust was seen as being neurotic or hysteric, and women were actually treated for that. And that's not so long ago. So that explains, I think, the, yeah, the negative evaluation of female sexuality. So, Barbara, when this was pitched, what drew you to it? Why did you decide to do it? Well, I think um, in these times, uh, I actually have to say that Sunny did a series for us called Sunny Side of Sex in Uganda, China, Cuba, and India um, before this one. And before that, she did another film about sexuality, so or about the female Look, body. body. Yeah. So we knew what she could do. And... I think it's really important to show, to show sexuality on television in a normal way, not the sort of pornified way or the tattooed um, way, the extreme way, but just completely normal people. So that's why, um, why we did it. And I think it's really important because I have the feeling that it's becoming more and more conservative instead of more open. While the internet is there and you can see everything on TV, it seems to be the other way around. And did you find it a challenge to persuade people in the broadcasting, you know, in, in, in Dutch broadcasting, that you should do it? I mean, do you, is, is there a, is there a, a We're in the, in, the, in the luxurious situation in the Netherlands mm -hmm. that we do not have to have any of these kind of discussions it, because they leave it up to us, the commissioning editors. If we have a good sense of what we want to do, then um, we can just do it. We do need to notify our bosses that there might be some contro uh, controversy going on around the, the broadcast, but no, we... It's generally a good idea to notify your bosses of that, isn't it? Well, yeah, but, but I mean, and with this one, because um, Sunny wrote a book about the same side effect as well, the, the publicity was huge, 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 so it was perfectly fine. And, of course, it did really enormously well as well. And, and the interesting thing is that in the Netherlands, we, um, you can choose a new modern word in the dictionary every year. And um, it was between selfie and slutphobia that the Dutch audience decided that slutphobia should maybe be the new word in our dictionary, but it turned out it, to be we're in the We're in the <laughs> dictionary. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pretty, pretty, pretty <laughs> good. Um, should we look at the second clip from slutphobia? Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's really funny that first he says I've had eight partners and then he's lost count as well <laughs> to <laughs> keep up with his friends. <laughs> Interesting phrase used there, the commodification of women. Uh, Jermaine Greer in a session yesterday said she thinks feminism is just mm -hmm. beginning. Um, to, to what extent do you, do you think that's part of TV culture? You've talked about pornography, which mm -hmm. is to some extent television, but also mainly the internet, obviously. Do, mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the role of TV is in that? sphere, uh, do you think it's created this commodification of women and do you think that's why we need to rectify it? Well, you can't, you can't ever say what's the cause and what's the result, it's all, it's all interlinked, but I do see in a lot of uh, pop popular culture, you see the whole kind of whore, virgin dichotomy, what I'm actually tackling, you see that in popular culture, in films, in, in talk shows as well, I mean, you have the good girl and the bad girl, and, um, and of course, the whole... Uh, I mean, I, I, I did an analysis of our main talk show in Holland, and I, 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 t I counted how many women were on the panel and, and how, how many men. And then I also uh, um, looked at the women that were invited, how young they were, and what their profession was. And a disproportionate amount of the women that were invited were very beautiful. They were actresses uh, compared to the men who are much older. So you see it in all arenas, this kind of sexism. And... Um, I'm against it. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I try to bring a female perspective in this uh, arena. And I think a lot of, I mean, I noticed a, 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 a very big difference in the broadcasting station where I work, like Barbara is now my boss. And, and there is a lot more 
uh, space for female-oriented or perspective-driven films that, are, that you can call feminist. Whereas where, when I started, I was the, the beginning of my 20s, there was, I would propose a film, for example, about abortion or pornography, and they would say that's boring or feminism is passé. And so it, it is changing in that sense, at least in my workplace. Now, sorry, you were commissioning docs in that territory Many, a little while many, ago. Many, many years ago. Yeah, no, I've, I, I've, in pre preparation for this, I actually, I, un, unlike some of the women in your film who are writing down all the numbers of their lovers, I was actually writing down all the programmes I'd commissioned or made, and, <laughs> and I got to about 60. Was, I mean, not 60 separate titles, se 60 separate films, which is many, many more than the lovers I've had. So I've actually been commissioned. <laughs> how, how many I did the one really question at the beginning. We're not doing any more. Yeah, can we ask your number as well? Because it was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got... I've, no, I've we didn't go there? Broadcast, okay, so. okay. Uh, <laughs> did, you, did you have the same motivations when you started doing it? I, um, I went to a Catholic school and I got told by the nuns, don't ever look at yourself in the bath. And, and I knew there was something wrong about this. And, and I had a friend who was highly intelligent who was going to Oxbridge. And she was trying to use a tampon. This is a really, guys, close your ears if you don't want to hear this sort of story. But she was trying to use a tampon for the first time. And she put the tampon up her anus because she didn't know where her vagina was. This was an 18-year-old, highly intelligent woman, did not know where her vagina was. And it's sort of, I've been on a bit of a mission ever since to try and educate women about their own bodies. Um, I, I first got into trouble of this when I was on Nationwide in 1981, working for a man called Roger Bolton, and I used to, get, I used to do the um, female gynaecology health stories, and we did, there was big stories about cervical cancer screening, and I had to commission a graphic of where the cervix was. And the cervix, on its own, is meaningless. I just wanted to do four little lines to show the tops of the thighs just to show where the cervix was. And I wasn't allowed to, on, on, uh, because this was at tea time, Strong to have two, four little graphic lines to denote where the legs were, to show where the cervix was. Um, so I've sort of been pushing against that ever, ever since. Should we have a look at your first bit? Yeah, so I've, I'm, in amongst all the many, many things I've done, the one that I'm, I was asked to bring on something that I'm, that I'm quite proud of, and it's, it's not a brilliant clip, but it, it, absolutely, it shows, it's, it was called The Truth About Female Desire, and I, was, I made it when I was at Endemol, and we put six girls in a house for a week, and we brought the leading scientists from the Kinsey Institute over, John Bancroft and uh, other scientists, and they subjected these girls, normal, everyday girls. One was gay, one had, was very sexually active, one monogamous, the whole group of the whole range, and we subjected them to a whole series of scientific tests about the nature of their sexuality and the nature of their desire. And it was the most amazing week, it really was. So this clip shows them, uh, so this is the, the Truth About Female Desire clip, and it shows them taking plaster casts of their own vulvas, because many, many women don't even recognize what their own vulvas look like because they've never looked at it. And the other bit is where we did something that had never been done before, where a, um, a, a, le a Korean leading ultrasound expert wanted, had always wanted to film in real-time ultrasound, the nature of clitoral engorgement during arousal. And he'd never, ever been able to find a subject to come and do it. And we said, we've got some girls who'd be willing to do it. And the actual images aren't that brilliant, uh, but this was the first time ever in the world that real-time imaging of clitoral engorgement during arousal was ever done. And that's a clench fame. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Some marvellous scripting, marvellous <laughs> scripting in that. Really interesting that, as with Slut Phobia, actually, you had, you had to bring humour to it, and there was and generally quite pretty people in that clip. Yes. Do you feel that's the only way to, to broach these subjects? <sighs> oh, that's a, such a tricky question, <laughs> Greg. It really is. You, 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 you tell you want people to come to the show, and they're more likely to come to the show if they're pretty. You don't. Deliberately no. to go out of the way. But I mean, I do think that speaks yeah. to. I was. Uh, it really interesting to start with because one generally thinks that the Dutch are incredibly liberal and open, and it's fine, and you don't need to use these devices. As in British tele, you know, we are a prudish society in Britain. In the Netherlands, are not. But you still felt the need to bring humour to it. I you don't think do the Netherlands is not prudish. I think that's a misplaced uh, assumption we have about the Netherlands. Like to think they're so tolerant and stuff, but it's a very uh, uh, on the on the on the surface. But it's all comparative because you're so much more open than than the Brits. 
in terms of, in terms of particularly in terms of sex education. Mm -hmm. Nearly every program on sex education in the UK ends up with this section at about 40 minutes in. It's so much better in Holland. And we have these clips of your sex education classes, and we have these clips about how at four and five years old, children are taught pro proper anatomical names for, for body parts. And, and we're all going, oh, we, if only we could be like the Dutch, things would be so much better. That's what, we, that's what we're told. Really? I think we all think that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> now the thing is, I think yeah. actually, um, I think your question like, do they all need to be beautiful? I don't think they need to be beautiful because I think actually that if you look at very beautiful young girls, then I'm not a very beautiful young girl. I wouldn't recognize myself in her. So I think it's very important to show all kinds of people in all kinds of size and all kinds of ages so that you actually feel like, oh, that could have been me. And I don't feel... Like, when I watched this clip, I didn't feel like, oh, that could have been me. Although yeah. their experience is very much something you recognize, but... Without getting too much into your history of clitoral engorgement. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, but the whole thing is, I mean, for me, I, for me, I, I really like it if they're really, really normal people. And was that, was that, was that your, that's always been your ambition, hasn't it, Sarah, to, do, to show normal real sexuality. Yeah, I mean, I, f I feel that television, television is so important. It's in everybody's household. It's, it sets the agenda so much as well as reflecting society. It also creates the, the, the zeitgeist. It creates the agenda. It's, and I've always believed that is nowhere that television can't go. Uh, and, and yet, this, this is in the area of sexuality that there is the biggest gap between the discourse we have on our own, in our own bedrooms and with our girlfriends and the conversations we have, and what's actually on the table. There's more distant, there's more gap there than there is with probably any other subject area. And I feel it's partly my mission to try and bit by bit creep and just try and get as much as I can of normal representation of what normal lies. It, and, you know, one in, one Do you think people want to see it? <sighs> I, I, I think you're absolutely right. We, we don't talk about it, certainly yeah. in Britain, because we're very uncomfortable talking about it. And therefore, seeing it on television is also quite challenging, isn't it? I mean, you, obviously, you bring audiences. To well, these there is a real dichotomy there because there, there is the there is the view that oh, you just put sex on late night, you'll get great ratings, and and frequently you can get quite good ratings. And so it's it's walking that tightrope between yes, I want a show that will rate. I don't want to make telly into into the into for no one to watch it. But I, you know, I, every time I do something that I want to write, I want to just know that in that show there was just that little bit of extra takeout knowledge, there's that little bit of extra revelation, a little bit of comfort, for a little bit of source of help for someone that's having a dysfunctional sex life. And therefore, confronting people with that. Well, let's come on to the sort of uh, the, the week women came. Yes, Great title. Because you don't like this next topic, do you? <laughs> I'm very you said to me last Absolutely. night, oh God, we don't have to do elderly sexuality, do we? You said that. I did not say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to drop you, but you did. Yes, um, <laughs> luckily, I'm still terribly youthful. Um, but, uh, but I think um, talking to that point of, of, yeah. of, of going into the area which, which people generally don't talk about, yes. elderly sexuality is definitely a, an area we're very uncomfortable about. So should we have a look at this? Yeah, so this was, a, this was a film called The Week the Women Came. It was just following a lady called Trudy Hannington, who's the chair of the College of Sexual and Relationship Therapists. And we followed two women who had, fa who had, had been orgasmic but had not come for at least four years, one of whom was a busy mum with two kids, and the other one was a postmenopausal woman who, didn't want, who had uh, uh, atrophied vagina, who had very, very painful intercourse and didn't whatever want to have uh, penetrative intercourse ever again and she didn't want to take hormones and it was just f following their case through and the clip you're going to see is the night after they've both been the, her and her husband have been told you've got to touch each other but you mustn't do any more than that and this is the first time he'd been able to touch her body for four years because she was so frightened of leading him on and this is the little letter he wrote her the next morning And how does a show like that go down, that, as it were? Um, okay, I will be absolutely honest with you. When the film arrived, uh, I'm really proud of it, actually. It's, it's actually. And she blossomed, and she then, as a result of this, she ended up being prepared to have other ways of coming, and she had multiple orgasms. And, it was, and you, you could see the transformation of her. She looked glowing, and she just, you know, it had totally changed her life. Um, we didn't play it on the main channel. We, we had to play it on more four because it was because uh, it's very sensitive it's quite there it's about older people it's not high octane it's not arousing it's not it's a gentle 
film and we decided to play it on more full instead because we knew it would probably only get about half a million nominations. I mean, that's, that's what I was, that's I what I was going to ask. Do, I do, know. Do, do, it, was that your decision or do you, um, do you incorporate the decision of others? It was the decision that the, the, the scheduling department made and I accepted and understood it and understood why that decision had been made. I, I would have preferred it had been on the main channel, but it's, it's fine. It's, I have to work. We work together as a team <coughs> and they said... It'll be better on more four. It'll get. It, it won't be as much. Ha won't have as much competition. But is that talking to a broader truth about society? Then you think that we just audiences are terribly uncomfortable watching old people talk about sex. These people weren't that old, were they? She's sixty. I didn't mean old. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, yeah. I, I think Older. that's a devaluation of yeah. the world. Old, but um, mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> but do you, I mean, it, it, Barbara, you've commissioned a lot in this area mm -hmm. as well. Do you find you have to, you're actually, you're having to push society to pay attention to these issues rather than... It's my mission. It's my mission. I think it's really important because um, I think uh, media is so over-sexualized in pornographic ways that I think it's really important to show a normal side of things. Yeah, so it's really a mission for me to do that. Do you want to queue up your first clip? Sure. Um, I'm going to introduce it to you. It's um, a film that we aired last week. Some of you, been in the other session, have seen some of it already, but then I'm going to show new bits as well. Um, it's a film called 69 Love Sex Senior. Um, it is about sex with the elderly. Um, they're all about uh, above 69. Most of them are at the end of their 80s or beginning of their 90s. And we aired it last week to uh, a 10% audience share, which was great. It started at 8.30 in the, in the, in the evening. And um, Twitter went wild on it because everybody loved it so much. And most of the Twitter was really also about how surprised they were uh, with, the, with the issues. And then the next day, what I absolutely loved, about 115 elderly people called the VPRO because they don't do email. I was going to say, they do, they do <coughs> tend to like to call. It was so sweet, so the receptionist, like in the afternoon, gave me the numbers. I think there's all these really old people calling to say how much they love the film. It was really great. But what I'm going to show you now first is the trailer of the film, so you sort of see a bit of the, the, the broadness of the different people, and then we're going to see one big scene. <laughs> So, so I what I really like about this clip as well, it's really long, right? And you think, I, I, I'm looking at you, and she's asking one question, you think like, okay. But then the next question, and then the next one, and then the next one, it's just, you all got so quiet. It's really interesting to see that, and you're all probably having sweaty hands now, thinking like, wow, did she ask all these things? But I think even like taking the time to have people just talk about this in, a, in their well, own way, it's really... Utterly right. I mean, you could not be further away from the commodification of women you were talking about earlier on in that clip. It's such an unusual thing to see on, on telly, isn't it? How did it, how did it do when you, have you put it out yet? Yeah, last week, I mean, we had a 10% audience share. It was really good. But the thing <laughs> is, what I find really intriguing, that's also why I wanted to do this session, is, um, and that the same goes for Sonny's film, I don't get it. I don't get the international audience, because I think there's really an audience for this, but buyers keep on telling us, no, it's way too explicit, what you're doing. And I don't, I don't explain to me why this is way too explicit. And what is interesting as well, because you keep saying it's, it's so far away or we don't see this, but what, what I find with the programs I make is that the only response, apart from like the really sexist, like you're a whore and blah, 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 but the serious response I get is for people like, wow, we're so happy you're going beyond the stereotypes, you're, we're so happy to see real honesty. And I think, I mean, there's a real market for it. People are really sick of uh, just the that, same that, reproduced cliches that is uh, seen in pornography. But do you think that television has a natural tendency to be towards cliche and stereotype? Yes. Thing. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you, I mean, do you see many films like this? Can you, do you, uh, it's unusual, isn't it? I'm not, I mean, I'm not wrong in that. No, it is unusual. But but tell me, explain to me, because we're... Why? Yeah, yeah, explain, you explain to me or you I was, why this is too I was explicit. just going to ask Sarah, can you imagine that ever being on a British channel? Uh, 
we, Channel 4... Um, no, tell me BBC 4. No, uh, uh, Channel 4 only last week did a, a film called uh, it was, uh, My Granny the Escort, and it was, it was uh, slightly jazzier than that, uh, but it was still a, a respectful film looking at why older women go into prostitution. And I can imagine that on more four. I can imagine yeah. that. I can imagine can that. On can you imagine that on BBC Four? Yeah. And explicitness. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that because I think yeah. we—I mean, I think we certainly were more explicit on TV 15, 20 years ago. So you, you, know, you remember the days of the pink triangle on Channel Four? Yeah, you see yeah, a lot more erect yeah. penises then than you see on TV yeah, no, now. Yeah, no. And, and uh, I did—I commissioned a film called Animal Passions, which was about bestiality. <laughs> I commissioned a film called Beyond Lo Love about necrophilia and. Could you still do that now? Um, we, we, Channel Four is the channel of the most extremes representation of sexuality in, in Britain and we have a very broad array of some superb films I mean Anna Morales's Dogging Tales uh, went out recently which is a really respectful humane look at the reality and the sadness of people who indulge in dogging um, and I, I, I think some of the things I did 15 years ago on telly I don't think I would do now I think there was a little bit of a railing back on and I know why, and it's because pornography has become so explicit and so extreme that we now feel the need to be s more so clearly seen as intimacy separate. So intimacy is yes. a new pornography, then? Yeah. Oh. No, no, I'm, I'm, sa I'm saying so this... There is yeah, so what does explicit mean in this? Yeah, in I mean, I yes, absolutely. And I think some of the things that we would have done is now would be, is conflated. And it's, I think it's the regulators have got a little bit more nervous, and, and we obviously self-censor hugely, and there's just... The odd little thing where I know it would have passed uh, 10 years ago, and I've got the same content lawyer. Uh, uh, I go back years with the same content mm -hmm. lawyer. And we have a chat and we say, oh, we probably would have done that, but pass, just you know, cut that clip one second shorter there. Just don't show that. I, d I did a film recently. We did um, Rupert Everett on prostitution. And Rupert Everett actually goes into... Uh, he's, it's a very, very liberal... It's, he's, he's trying to put yeah. prostitution back into the mainstream and acknowledge the public service that they perform. And he spends a day with the dominatrix and he goes into the dungeon with her and he's actually taking part in the uh, sex act and he's actually whipping the client begin, in the gimp mask. It's quite, it's quite I extreme. Wish you had a clip of that. No, I could have brought that. Um, and, but there's, we pixelated various bits and I think we pixelated just a little bit more than we would have done and 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, it's the idea of that. I think th that's in in slut phobia as well. That the, the problem, but this is kind of going into how female sexuality is being constructed. Uh, that it's tied to looking sexy. Yeah. I I think there's something quite interesting about this. There's still a fear and a revulsion of an older woman wonderfully talking about enjoying pleasure. Well, you know, we had, we had complaints about six, uh, 69 Love Sex Senior because the 94-year-old uh, the gay guy um, has a, is giving his boyfriend a blowjob at one point in the film, and you just see him sort of like leaning over, and you don't actually see him doing the thing. And then afterwards, you see them, you saw a little bit of that in the trailer, naked, yeah. sort of like... Um, just getting back to, 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 to normal breathing, but we had quite a bit of complaints about that scene. They found that We really did a film um, for More Four, actually, um, some years ago in 2005, 2006, called Young at Heart, and it was about a chorus of seniors who sang rock songs. And one of the characters, Steve, was still very sexually active, and we asked him in the film, you know, 
so how is it for you? And he said, it's great. It takes longer, but it's better than ever, you know. And, and it was funny and charming, and, mm -hmm. and everybody kind of took it from him. But I, I think if we had asked his lover, Marianne, people would have found that difficult. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I might be wrong, but I still think there's that imbalance. And I think some of that is tied into the, the, the pornographic world, isn't it? It is that sense that you, all you ever see is, uh, I think you were talking about pubic hair earlier on, Sarah. I was um, talking about pubic hair. The pubic hair is now one of the most forbidden things, that, you know, and you are now, we're now getting to the situation where 14-year-old girls are, you, uh, are removing their pubic hair as soon as it arrives and not un having no respect for their own bodies and the difference of their own bodies, and that's a product of porn as well. What I found as yeah. well in, in the research on female sexuality is that what happens is that women objectify themselves. So yeah. if they've internalized a male gaze, there's an in interesting experiment which I do in the film whereby I watch at naked uh, men and women and, and I, my eyes go as much to the woman as to the man. And it, this is all, all women react the same, what most women, heterosexual women. And from that, the sexuologist, she cl concludes that women are very self-objectifying uh, um, um, self during sex. So they can't, they can't experience lust just as a subject, but as a subject and as an object. So they're always thinking about how they look in the eyes of the other. And I think, I think that's very true. I, I think going back to a point much earlier that all of you were making is that, uh, Sarah, you were making that Actually, it's not very long ago. I mean, I was at drama school in the early 70s where everybody was having sex with everybody. It was, but this was a very new thing. And, and actually, having started having sex at 16, it wasn't until I was 21 that I discovered there was such a thing as a female orgasm. And it took Cosmopolitan magazine's launch and an article about it for me to ask my friend Glennis, have you heard about this? <laughs> and she said, yes. And I said, how, how do you do it? And she said, well, you just rub a lot. And I went, how? Why hasn't nobody told me about this? It's because Sarah wasn't yet commissioning programs. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question there in the back. Sorry, Sorry just to build we're on... Sort of, we're being a bit freeform about this now, yeah. but I think that's fine. Like freeform, good. Um, sorry, just to um, go further on, on, on your point. Sorry, madam, I don't know your name. Um, but the idea of uh, being more troubled by female sexuality, I find it incredibly interesting that and, and nice that we have three women on a panel here at Dot Fest. Um, also quite astonishing, actually, now that you say so, because I have never had any male colleagues addressing sexuality. You? In their films? W male colleagues? What, doing have commissioned films about yeah. female sexuality? Uh, well, I've, worked, I've collaborated for many years with Simon Andre, who mm, made quite a lot of, <laughs> of my films, and I then commissioned him to make a lot of films, and then he commissioned me to make lots of films. So, no, I've never... Yeah, so Simon is... Which is, which is interesting, but then can I also just say my, my observation so far on the panel, to give you an update, is that we have only been talking about female sexuality. I, believe me, I'm about to approach that. Great. Um, can, I, can I just also say that I think that this sort of idea of like troubling older female sexuality and what has kind of started to bubble up from what you've been saying is the difference between sex on screen as titillation or as uh, something that we can relate to and that and that tension the idea of like you know we we have pretty you know we, we kind of seduce an audience the spectator with titillation in order to educate and and make people feel less alone in their sexuality is that is that what we still have to do I was going to say, even slut phobia, even the way that's shot, mm -hmm. fairly intimate, you're very close to them. It is slightly, there's a slight titillation feeling the way you construct those shots. Really? I think. The, the tense shots? No, not the tense. Yeah, uh, when they're lying down. Yeah, that's yes. Oh, no, I think, I think that, again, it's intimacy we're talking <laughs> about here. But, okay. Um, do, you, do, you, do you consciously feel any of... Sorry? I mean, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that as a criticism, but I, 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 the mm -hmm. the need to be sort of slightly shockingly intimate to get that subject matter across. But it is an int intimate subject matter. I mean, I think <coughs> my problem was you're making a film about sex, and I didn't want to show sex, um, and and so it's you know you're always thinking in scenes and how can I film scenes? But I mean, I just basically wanted to unearth. Um, these feelings that people don't really discuss. Like, for, for example, a very important thing I felt uh, was that people admitted, like a lot of women admitted 
to having sex that wasn't that good and they weren't telling their partners that it wasn't that good and they were embarrassed to really say what they wanted or they didn't know what they wanted and a lot of women... But they would say that on screen? They would and, and I thought that was a real breakthrough because I was even, like even in talking to my friends, I, I would be embarrassed saying that about myself, you know, and, and then... I was so happy to find other women. Although you have to, I don't want how many lovers you've had. But um, <laughs> well, that's, that's just a number. That's not really that exciting. But um, um, anyway, to me. But, <laughs> <laughs> but really talking about your vulnerabilities and your shame, that's really, really scary. So we, we've talked a lot... I, I, about male sexuality, well, because I it's... Just yeah. about, I mean, we talked a lot. There, there is a, that danger that you... That male sexuality is never talked about, and we can talk about this in this territory. And in fact, yeah. you know, I think men are just as interesting. Personally, I think men are just as interesting sexually as, as women. Um, <coughs> but it's not something. I mean, I do not think Should we stereotype. Really we stereotype yeah. uh, male sexual behaviour on TV more than anything else, don't we? Oh, I don't think so. No, there's a, there's a broad range of stuff. I mean, I do think that this thing that's happened. Name a programme, though. And what a programme that has got a broad, a the, the, nuanced nature of male. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Dogging Tales, okay, first Dogging dates, Dogging. 40 year old virgin. Do you remember 40 year old virgin? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that, I'm not going to mention my big fat fetish because that was, you know, that's not a, the particularly attractive side of male sexuality. But should I go on to the porn mm. on the brain? Yes, stuff? that's But can exactly I say yes. something yes. about that? Because what I found, because uh, talking to men, was that because we have this stereotype of what is being male, masculine, mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. feminine, yeah. um, for a lot of men that I interviewed, they said that they said that they suffer very much from the idea that men have to want sex all the time, that they have to boast about it, that they know what they what what they, what to do. A lot of men are very insecure, so that's as stifling a stereotype maybe as the beauty standard can be for women. So, um, actually, we're we're making a series, and the first episode uh, is uh, on, on male uh, sexuality, and and there was also some interviews whereby men admitted, for example, that they couldn't keep their erection and that it's very uncomfortable because women then think that they're not attractive enough and it's a kind of a downward spiral because then it becomes pressure and then they can't keep it like and 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 these are things i think for men it's even more hard to be vulnerable yes yeah. Yeah. Well, let, yeah. let's come on to your yeah, so por porn on the brain, I mean, I do think there is a, an elephant in the room in all this, that the, here we're debating about the subtle nuances of how much intimacy and explicitness we have on telly. And mm. there, on that phone now, you can see 40 Alsatians and, and three cups of poo, you know. I mean, it's just... <laughs> the, Give me a moment. <laughs> <laughs> that what's, you know, and, and that 13, 12, 9-year-old kids are looking at that stuff all the time, really, really easily, and it's causing immense damage to the ability to understand their own sexuality. And you, you talk about loss of a loss of erection. Mm -hmm. Some of the boys that we talked to in our films, which is called Porn on the Brain, were talking about they could not sustain uh, uh, an erection to to climax anymore because they were just so used to the visual cues from pornography, and they just couldn't make love to a woman normally anymore. So what this film was doing was to try and investigate whether there's actually any neurological change in, in, in extreme pornography users. And we took um, 20 men and uh, did MRI brain scans on them, and we found that their brains were very, very similar to heroin abusers. And these are people that were uh, masturbating 12, 15 times a day. And the film's presented by a man called Martin Daubney, who used to be the editor of Loaded magazine. And... He is doing a bit of a mea culpa because he's a sort of soft pornographer from the past and he's now got a young son and he feels that pornography is robbing the next generation of any level of normal ability to learn about sex gradually. And in the film we follow a young man called Callum who came to us who admitted he was masturbating up to 30 times a day. It was one of the most extreme cases and Martin's carried on working with him afterwards and taking him to residential help programmes and things. So this is Porn on the Brain. Oh, Again, how amazing that people are, he was willing to talk about that. Yeah, I know. We had to interrogate in great detail why he was. And um, he was... I, I, don't, I don't know why he was. And, and we had to be so sure that he wasn't conning us and that he yeah. was who he said he was. And it didn't help when we discovered that what his surname... What, his surname was Rist, Callum Rist. 
and um, it was you couldn't make that up. You couldn't make it up, and we did. We actually we 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 did an enormous amount of research on him throughout. Year. And and Martin actually spe- Martin filmed that himself, and Martin actually spent a week with him. And we we do genuinely believe it. You have to it, sometimes when you're when you're some someone have said they can consent. You have to think why have you actually done this? You know we have to make sure he's not doing it to get back at his mother or get back at his father. You have to work out why they're doing it. And, and they protect them in a way. I was going to say, Sonny, did you feel that with your contributors? Yeah. To get um, them to talk so candidly? Yeah, especially, I, I feel it, especially with young people, like these boys in the beginning, for example, I was a bit worried about that, to be honest. And, and, and it was <coughs> good that it was broadcast in the Netherlands, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, but it's it's... I have also a clip about pornography. Can, can uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, that was kind of halfway through the scene. What, what, how it ends up is that they they really look down upon certain women as well, and I I I analysed in that a sense of uh, self survival because they know that they're the ones that are seen as the bitches, the hoes, the the sluts. So they need to put themselves outside of that category by looking down upon other w- girls who they who are the real bitches, the ones who have sex in the disco, or the ones that have sex, unprotected sex, uh, in escort. So there's a whole categorization going on about bad women, and they're not really bad. And that's, of course, like a societal thing. But th- there is that rather strange thing in all, everything we're talking about so far, which is the people for whom we're making these programs are also the people consuming that pornography. It's yeah. not like there's a separate <coughs> distinction. But I, I mean, you hope that people start thinking about it. I mean, I, I remember when we were in Berlin and we were there, and it was so weird because all the men walking around, they were all with cameras, and they were zo- really <coughs> literally just zooming in on the vaginas. And my poor cameraman, he was walking around, and he said, I'm just like one of them. No one notices that I'm any different. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and then we were driving through Berlin, and I was looking at all the men, and I was thinking, well, anyone? Because I was so, like, yeah, I was kind of really upset by the audience. And then you think, well, but that's anyone. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, Barbara, do you, let's do your next clip. Um, okay. Moving on slightly. So, do you want me to introduce? Well, actually, no, I'm not going to introduce. I'm just going to show it to you. Gay meets girl. I'm not going to talk about gay husbands at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what do you to that? That's quite different from what we've been talking about so far, isn't it? Yeah, well, these two uh, boys, uh, Nicolas and Tim, they're very young. They're like 26 years old or something. And... Um, they came to me with this idea, and they're as sincere about going on this journey as you could see in this, this shot. They really wanted to know what their homosexuality was about, whether that was a biological thing or something driven by society. And they came up with this idea that, that Tim should have sex with a woman and that they would explore his journey on could he do that or not, and is it biological or psychological or sociological. And um, it was an amazing journey he went on. He first went to a sex therapist. That you, that's the woman like, oh, you're not wearing any underwear. And he was really all the time completely innocently going into this, which was really beautiful. Um, and at the end of the film, he um, meets this French girl who speaks like seven languages and is a porn actress, an escort, but also a scientist and all kinds of things. And she is, she's, she's really amazing as well. And they actually have sex, and it's amazing sex, he thinks. But at the end of the film, he says, like, um, now I know that sexuality is more about making a true connection to someone, and it doesn't really matter whether that's a, a, ba- a man or a woman, but it's all about the proper connection. You can have sex with anyone if you want to, but I prefer men. And that's also say, really good. I was going to say, is there not a danger that just gets massively heteronormative? And well, we were really, I mean, that was like an evening when we were airing it, that I was quite nervous, I have to say, and I did tell my bosses. But <laughs> <coughs> I, because we were actually expecting from the gay, uh, gay community um, lots of criticism about the film. Like now we finally, everybody has finally accepted that we're gay and that, that's okay. And now you're, saying, now you're, uh, now you're saying go and sleep with women yeah. to find out what it's like. You can, so you can we see w- why gays would be pissed off at that. Yeah, but if you see the film, you can also see that he really went on his journey and this is just his journey. And um, 
and it turned out really well and we were overwhelmed again by compliments and people saying how brave that you dare to show these kind of things. But for me, again, when I do that and I think like, okay, so what's the next step? Because I think this is so important that we do this. And especially also for, for, for gays to sort of also have like their normal sexuality portrayed on TV. Well, and it's terribly easy to turn that into a cliche and a stereotype. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So Rupert Everett, as a, as, a, as a sort of there as a gay man talking about a, a rem boy. Yes. You got beyond that, I think. Did you, you see it? Yes, I did see yes. it. Yes. Um, no, I thought. Were you aware of that? Did, did that terrible TV ability to go there's a gay man? It should be Graham Norton. Yeah, I Nothing think I Graham think Norton, Rupert is really <laughs> re Rupert's an incredibly thoughtful man, and um, his his willingness to put himself on the line and put himself into positions. You know th that he was he was talking to rent boys in the back streets, in, uh, 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 Palestinian rent boys in Tel Aviv bus station, through to crack whores on the streets of crack whores on the streets of uh, Liverpool, and he was sitting in a bedroom of a of a of a chick with a dick in Milton Keynes, who's a former bricklayer, um, while that man masturbates himself the whole way through, and we have to pixelate it, and I think Rupert is is so and R Rupert is obviously has had lots of sex with lots of women as well as lots, yes. lots of men. And his, op Madonna, I think, yes. Yes. his openness yeah. and his respect <laughs> for humanity and his respect for sexuality in all its manifestations, I think, really came through in that, which, which was good. But, but, uh, do, you yeah. but do you think generally gay portrayal on TV is inadequate? Or the, the, what is portrayed? The, the, the portrayal of gay life? I mean, but... Uh, I, I don't think we I haven't think seen anything that, that nuanced on TV. No, I mean, I, th I, I mean, what is great now is that you'll get someone on location, location, location who's, who's gay and it's yeah. not hardly commented on, that you will get people on Come Dine With Me and it's not commented on. And I think um, probably in terms of the percentage of the, po percent, yeah. Yeah, percent, yeah, the percentage <laughs> of the population, we're not doing enough of it still. We should be doing more in terms of just normal everyday life. I think gay wedding, you can have a big discussion about. Some people liked it. I adored it. I thought, I thought it was lovely. Um, yeah, I think we could do a little bit more, but not, yeah, I think it would be. I think yeah. something, I think we have the clip, clip too. Do we, the, the Uganda clip? Oh yeah. We do, okay, yes. That. And that, can I introduce it? Because yep. it might be, bit, like, I'm, I made this series um, about sexuality in non-Western cultures, because I, I felt that we have a misplaced idea in the West that, that we are the end of uh, development, uh, also on the area of sexual, um, sexuality and emancipation, because, and when I traveled, I found a lot of new ideas and inspirations in other cultures that could actually teach us something, Westerners. And one of the countries I went to is Uganda, and of course Uganda is very known for being very, very homophobic, but if you, um, um, if you open up yourself to the culture and really want to learn about it, we, we, we discovered there was a, a practice there whereby women pull each other's labia because they, they think it's more beautiful and more sexually stimulating to have big labia. And it's, of course, the opposite of the beauty standard here for the vagina. And um, I, I had that done on me. I had someone pulling my labia. And um, it's actually... It's a lot of crazy here every day in Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, young girls do that too. They, they get taught to, to pull each other's labia when they're in their, in their teens. And uh, what I, I discovered was, talking to women, is that that was a really nice way to discover that your vagina is something nice and pleasurable and you can pleasure each other. So that was, to me, a pa paradoxical situation. So, and we just see a clip from this. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we went to four different countries where, uh, uh, where we had all these kind of experiences. It was really amazing. Yeah, and it, it was, I think, it was quite hard to do the research because you have to find something like that's really new that would peop teach uh, people something new. Um, but uh, especially the Uganda one was very popular because people were, like, uh, there was a woman in there, an anthropologist who's from Zimbabwe, who I interviewed, who was... Uh, she was great and she was working for an NGO and she said, oh, I'm going to do a film with Sunny Bergman about pl uh, female pleasure in sex. I and, and her boss actually said to her, do African women enjoy sex? I didn't know. So she, 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 the stereotype of this suppressed African woman like a clitoridectomy, that's like 
what we see, and she was so happy that there was another side. To well, I, th I think it. challenging stereotypes is exactly what we've been talking about yeah. all the time, isn't it? Yeah. Um, right, I'm going to throw you open to the floor for, for just about 10 minutes. Um, Margie, go ahead. Thank you so much for you know sharing all those. She's films. smart, isn't she? Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> She's like a mother. <laughs> um, Don't think about your friends. Everyone. <laughs> There's so many incredibly interesting things. Um, I wanted to sort of be really. Uh, I, I'm scared of sounding very naive, but Sarah, you know me well enough to know that that is probably how I am on some of these issues. But is pornography, which there does seem to be this subject, you know, and it's almost kind of trendy, I think, to talk about how pornography is having this shockingly devastating effect on... I just... I feel like it's really a bit overhyped. And I just wanted to ask you, if, if you put it in the context of addiction, which it seem, it sort of slightly normalises it, you know, people have trouble with drugs, they have trouble with alcohol, this young boy um, obviously had a sex addiction, but we know about sex addicts and, you know, they are kind of fairly well documented, I think. I'm just wondering whether, what you really genuinely believe. I think it's a really, it's a kind of a hot subject and idea, but really how prevalent is it? How many 15-year-old boys are really watching porn to the extent that they can't have sex with their girlfriends? It's a very, very good question, Margie. I think that just as we can have two or three glasses of wine, and that'd be fine, and just we two or three. Yeah, and enjoy it, and it'd be pleasurable, uh, just like that, it is perfectly acceptable. Acceptable. I'm not morally. I'm not making any moral uh, uh, statements here. It's okay to uh, masturbate to pornography once a day, twice a day. That that it's not. It's when it becomes seriously problematic to the lifestyle and the relationships of the people that are doing it. And because teenage boys are, have got brains that make them yearn and seek out high sensation seeking, they are at the most vulnerable age to most seek it out. And there are those personality types that are more vulnerable to addiction. And it's not healthy to do it 30 times a day. That, that boy has not has got time. proper relationships. Yeah. And he's got a sore penis as well. Uh, but also, yeah. I mean, even if you're not talking about addiction, the way it reinforces and sh actually shapes your sexuality. I talked to a sexuologist who said the first sexual experience or the first kind of erotic impulse that you have does actually shape your fantasy. So if you're watching something like 30 men coming in the face of one woman, that is going to have an influence on the way you're going to get turned on later on in life. So even, even though you... you, you maybe someone is not addicted, but I, I've got two boys, two sons, and I'm really confused as to how to deal with that because I don't want them to have a female unfriendly sexuality, but I can't hide the world from them. <laughs> so, and then on the other hand, they think I disagree with women in bikinis because they misunderstand my work or something, but, but they, so it's, it's, you know, I don't want them to, to be embarrassed about being lustful as well. So it's, it's really difficult, it, I it, think. It is also the ease of access. In, yeah. in 50 yeah. years ago, you have to fill in a little form and send it off, and then two weeks later, you get a brown paper package and you open it up, and I've, you know, you used to find it behind your dad's cabinet and, 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 <laughs> and, um, or you had to go into London, go to Soho and go down into a basement. It was, it was a major effort to actually get it. It was now. It's, but it's but it's also, also, it so wasn't easy. image. It was a lot of magazines. So you could fantasize on what you were reading. And now it's full in your face. And um, there's, I don't think it's a hype. I think it's very serious. You see uh, that especially boys are very confused about their sexuality. Even, uh, again, maybe uh, intimacy is the new pornography. Um, they don't know what intimacy means then anymore, and and uh, that it is. So, so there's a female academic that's been looking at young girls' first sexual experiences and and plotting them over the years, and have found that the first uh, sexual encounters tend to be more violent, more forceful. There's uh, there's more slapping and 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 definitely more anal and. Just or the, the, um, Martin and his family went to a, uh, a class with 14-year-olds and they had to write all the words they knew on, on the wall from A, a to Z and they put as many sexual words they knew against. I mean, everybody had 
everybody in the class, 30 kids, age 14, had watched anal on, and, and double penetration. Okay. And then they were coming up with these other names, so like true, nuggets. So, and, and, and Martin Dolby didn't even know what a nugget was. And I don't know what a nugget, a nugget is. is. A nugget is a armless, legless, amputee it, porn character. Ew. Wow. And That's these were 14-year-olds that were talking about nuggets. Wow. Oh. Yeah. On, on, on that jolly note. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a question up there at the back. So, sorry, uh, Sally. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm a porn studies academic myself, and I find that what I find troubling is that I'm not saying that porn is completely uh, not to blame, or because it's 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 a prevalent force and it's going to have be a cause of various effects. But what I find more troubling is that well, porn kind of is seen as it's a bit naughty, even if it is readily accessible. It's something you shouldn't be doing. Whereas turning on telly and or you know the Notebook comes on, for example, romantic, isn't it? Well, it's not because. Ryan Gosling's character, who's the romantic hero, threatens Rachel McAdams character. Uh, if he, she doesn't go out with him, he'll drop to his death from this Ferris wheel. Oh, isn't it romantic? How persistent he is. No, it's, it's creepy. It's manipulative. It's completely denying her any consent or autonomy. So I don't think it's just pornography. I think it's... No, but that's why... Yeah. Culture yeah. together yeah. is colluding, like documentary and fiction, to portray a very unhealthy level of relationship. And... I mean, in, in, in terms of male sexuality, it's not simply that, you know, I, I don't know whether anyone's seen the uh, spoof on YouTube, um, the women sort of asking Game of Thrones, like, where's the dick then? If we keep seeing tits, like, where's, where's the dick? Where's the equivalent? Where is the balance? And seeing the most incredible uh, Peter de Rome, grandfather of gay porn, which I thoroughly recommend to everyone in here, that celebration and the fact that there's something about an erect penis that we still can't show on TV. Channel 4 was the first ever channel to show an erect penis. Cheers, sir. Which was in uh, <laughs> Lars von Trier's The Idiots quite a few years ago now, but we were the first ones ever to do it. But I'm I, pretty yeah. sure I put one on BBC4 at some point. Yeah, but we did it first. <laughs> <laughs> but is it, I, I just, I find it interesting that we, we keep blaming porn, whereas if, which necessarily is, is commissioning editors, and we can't necessarily control what the porn industry is doing, but what can we do in terms of, of portraying a more... Another question over there? Yeah. Well, um, just I think in focus, I was suggesting of changing the title to How Close Can We Get, Not How Far Can We Go. Uh, kind yeah. of linking back to the mm. intimacy question and mm. the fact that we're not actually looking to bizarre <laughs> and freaky stuff, but we're looking at what Everyday, what's yeah. here and now, and that's disturbing just often. Beautiful. Two questions. Thank you. Uh, Fourteen-year-old sex and um, online affectivity, as in sorry, online affectivity, which is, you know, webcam sex workers and all that. Yep. Some good stuff that's that's been done recently on that, um, that you would suggest. Uh, and uh, I recommend also two really good, uh, the Peter de Rome, which is amazing. You should all see it. And um, Rebel Mon Menopause, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, a short 20 minute film, yeah. really good on, on this kind of French um, feminist grandma who's, uh, well, yeah, amazing. Okay. So yeah, that's just two questions for you. It's actually um, <clears throat> interesting. I um, once tried to do, I'll, I'll be two minutes and then we're, we're done. I once tried to do a series on, on elder, um, on elder women, on menopause, on um, um, female sexuality, um, um, and on um, sort of, um, I would call it like a menopause, but then more in a sort of sexual way. I couldn't get these films financed because I couldn't finance them in-house, which I thought was really interesting. But one that I really liked, and I really still want to do it, is a spoof documentary where um, this um, woman in her 40s tries to start a brothel for men and we were going to work with an actress, but she would actually go into the banks to see if she would get financing. She would actually make her business plan, try and get all the, uh, all the uh, how do you call it, vergunningen? Uh, permits. Permits that she needed uh, to do that. And then she would 
um, write a column in a, a female magazine and be on a talk show every now and then to sort of explain how things were evolving with her brothel. And of, of course, she would be casting um, a man to be in that brothel and she would um, talk to women about what kind of needs she wanted. And we came up with this brothel in the middle of nowhere that would be more like sort of retreat, that only men would work there, but you could say, can he come to my room now? And then the end of the film would be that she would be in this talk show and that she would like sort of like uh, celebrate the opening of the brothel that doesn't exist. And we, why did we want to do that? Because um, one of the magazines in the Netherlands, female magazines, said like, if you become a member of our magazine, you can have a gigolo. And within 10 minutes, they had like a thousand new members. And that's a film, again, that I re really want to do to why, push the why, sounds, why, like, why, sounds like a Channel 4 why format. Not, why does it have to not exist? Why don't we do it? Why don't we set one up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a brothel I would go to. But it was hard <laughs> to get that film financed. I couldn't get that funded. Oh, we should have a chat. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and that's how the magical commissioning happens. But I do... Um, I, uh, um, sorry. I do, I do find it a, 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 a shame that a lot of the topics still that are discussed here are about sex work or um, are, are st um, and then that's of course the problem when you want to look for topics to do with sex that, that it does become again in the area of Maybe titillation too. and uh, uh, away from everyday sex life even though I'm not saying there is any normal sex life but it, uh, do you know what mm. I mean? Mm. Like if, if you say my granny is an escort I don't yeah. know why yeah, yeah. Well, on that note... Um, um, but you I don't want to answer. <laughs> we could keep on talking for yeah, a very long yeah, time. Yeah, we have, yeah. we have <laughs> run out of time. But it's nice yeah. to be talking about sex and sexuality so openly and not, not late and like in a bar, but in fact in a proper public forum. Did you, was it hard for you? Yeah, because you were really nervous before this I am a terrible prude, it's true. <laughs> yeah. um, I've, I've enjoyed... I've, 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 I've like I haven't seen the word labia so much on screen for quite some time. <laughs> and... <laughs> it's been great. Thank you very much for coming. Okay.